Hola amigos, yo soy Cristiana Figueres y tenemos la alegría de presentarles y de compartir el libro El Futuro por Decidir, el cual he escrito con mi coautor. Hi, I'm, I'm Tom Rafikanak and it's a requirement of working with Cristiana that I can understand basic Spanish, but it's beyond my ability to do a public talk in Spanish. It's great to be here. I'm thrilled to be joining you today. My name is Tom Rivet Karnak. I'm the co-author with Christiana of The Future We Choose. And we are so thrilled that the Spanish edition is now launching. So I've been asked to tell you a little personal story of how I came to be involved in climate change. And that is a story that goes back to last century, believe it or not. Uh, way back in the 1990s when I was a new mother and wanted to take my two daughters to see a little golden toad that was a species endemic to Costa Rica that I had very much enjoyed and that had brought me close to nature when I was a child. And by the time my children were born, that species had disappeared. Not the individuals, but the entire species had disappeared. And I was shocked. And when I started asking the scientists what had happened, they didn't use the term global warming or climate change. They just said there is something happening that actually made this species disappear. So one thing led to the next. And very soon I found myself getting deeper and deeper into first understanding climate change and then negotiating climate change for Costa Rica, my country. And, um, and several decades later, leading the 195 countries to sign the Paris Agreement. And my own story in terms of climate change and how I got involved in this actually stretches back almost as far as I can remember. So growing up, I am the son of a petroleum geologist. So we traveled around the world, including living in Colombia in the 1980s, uh, looking for oil. And so that intersection of oil and energy and humanity was always very present in my mind. And growing up, I assumed that I would follow my, follow my father into that industry. But even in the late 90s, you didn't have to look far in the relationship between oil and society to realize that all was not very well. And as I started pulling on that thread, it unraveled and I saw what was happening and the devastation that was already occurring that would continue to unfold. So that has really defined the whole of my professional life. I have always been motivated by trying to do something around climate change. And I've had lots of wonderful opportunities to have an impact, including serving as Christiana's political strategist for the Paris Agreement when we worked together at the United Nations. Well, this, the story of how we met actually needs to be told by Tom because his version of the story is much better than my version of the story. <laughs> we should publicly compare our versions, actually, Christiana. So my version, and it can now be, I can be corrected by Christiana, is that um, a few years before the Paris Agreement, Christiana felt that she wanted to complement the many brilliant people who were working in the UN with somebody whose instincts were very much for political strategy and campaigning. So um, after some inquiries and through a mutual friend, um, that led her to reach out to me. And we had a conversation in New York, actually. Uh, we met, that's where I was living at the time, and we met in a park and we spent the day having lunch and walking from one end of Manhattan to the other. And at the end of the day, she, she explained to me throughout the day what was required, how we were going to have to get countries on board, the mountain that was left to climb, and the importance of what we were doing. Um, and at the end of the day, she turned to me and said, well, it's clear to me that you have none of the skills or experience necessary for this job, but I have a feeling you could do it. So let's try. And it was my first experience of how Christiana Figueres operates intuitively and thereby makes far more progress than most people very quickly. And I hope that it went OK. What do you think, Christiana? How did it turn out? I think it was a pretty darn good job. Congratulations. <laughs> The fact is that although it might be a little bit difficult to digest, we have already started what is now recognized as the decisive decade in the history of humankind. And that statement sounds like a Latin American exaggeration, but it is not. 
we have started the most important decade in the history of humankind because it is in this decade, in these nine years left to 2030, that we will be deciding between two futures for humankind on this planet. If we continue to pollute the atmosphere the way that we have been polluting for the past hundred years or so, we will be condemned to a future that is increasingly hot, increasingly prone to destruction, to floods, to cyclones, to glacier melts, increasingly exposed to thirst, hunger, conflict, forced migration, increasingly open to more and more zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19, and a world that is finally, uh, frankly so unstable that even the economic system would not be able to prosper, let alone the millions of people who are today already vulnerable and who under these conditions would be life-threatened. That is one future. And that is the future that we are likely to move toward unless we make dramatic changes right now. If we're able to make the dramatic changes that are necessary in our personal lives, if corporations make the decisions they need to, and if governments enact the policies that they need to enact, then by 2030, if we have cut our emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions from where they are today to one half, then we've actually opened the door to a world that is not just avoiding the dystopia that I have described, but actually a much better world than the world that we have now because it will be a world where the world is much greener, where the planet is much greener because we have planted so much. We have regenerated soils. We have regenerated forests. We have brought back many of the mangroves that we have destroyed. It is a world in which cities will be so much cleaner, quieter, because we will have gone beyond the internal combustion engine. In those cities, we will have transport that is efficient. It is a world in which we have moved our personal diets to substantially plant-based diets. And it is a world in which every family has access to clean, ubiquitous, renewable energy. So a very different world, a very, very different world. And we start the book with the description of those two worlds, because we have to realize that those two worlds are possible, but that only one is a morally responsible world for us to bequeath to those who come after us. So the choice is ours, and the choice is one that we are making in this decade. When Christiana said a few minutes ago that we are facing the most decisive decade in history, it's likely that many people listening to this would have felt a little recoil inside them and a, a small amount of fear about the fact that we're leaving this so late and we're getting so close and just how consequential that impact will be if we do not turn this around in a timely fashion in order to create that positive future that we set out in the book. So. No one else is going to do this. If we're going to turn this around, it's going to be those of us who are here now in positions of decision-making authority with the ability to determine what happens in countries, in cities, in governments. And that begins actually with, yes, a recognition of the severity of the situation, but also with a deep determination that we will do everything necessary to turn the path from the way we are currently headed to what we need to do. And that requires courage. That requires a determination to do the things that are difficult at the moment when they're really needed. If we don't have that, then the default mode when you're faced with a big risk like this 
can sometimes be that we end up moving inexorably towards it because we never reach the point of deep decision making that we will actually be part of the solution and we will work to create a better future. That's what we talk about as this stubborn, determined optimism that we will actually, while we can, decide to be part of that future. That doesn't mean ignoring the reality that there are serious challenges ahead and that some elements of that future are not going the way that we hope they would, although I should point out that many are. What it means is facing that reality very clearly, but refusing to be determined by it, refusing to say, therefore, it is inevitable for us to make the turn and do what's necessary. And if you look back at history, many of the most transformative moments have actually been quite dark and difficult moments. When people have stood up and said, I will hold my optimism as a candle in the darkness and actually find a way forward out of this difficult situation. We saw that in the middle of wars, at moments of, um, of throwing off colonial oppression. These, these, the success was far from guaranteed. That decision, that attitude is fundamental. And all of us making a decision that we are gonna be part of that future, everything else flows from there. Transforming our communities, transforming our cities, our companies, our countries, you know, the world itself. When we look back at what created the Paris Agreement, and Christiana will talk about this too, I'm sure, actually we would credit an attitude change. There were plenty of reasons why the Paris Agreement should have been impossible, but because everybody began to believe that it was possible and it was necessary, changed their attitudes and began to work, that was a major input into the transformation that ultimately turned into the positive outcome that we wanted. We need to now emulate that at a vast scale because the consequences and the stakes are higher now than they've ever been, but that also is a bigger opportunity for us to rise to that and face it with all of our humanity to turn this around while we can. When we talk about the decisive or the critical decade in the history of humanity, it is very understandable that each of us will feel completely overwhelmed and say, well, if it's that important, that big, then there's nothing that I can do about it. And I just have to accept whatever is going to happen. That, however, is not true. It is definitely true that governments need to play their part. It is definitely true that corporations need to play a part. but it is also very true that each of us individuals have a role to play because each of us is actually either contributing to the problem or contributing to the solution. And we do that individually through the way that we transport ourselves, the way we eat, the way we use energy, the way we decide to save our available cash if there is, if we're in that position. And certainly the way that we talk about this with others, we have to be able to accept our personal responsibility, move our daily habits and behaviors and decisions onto a responsible path and be able to bring those in our family and our friends and our neighbors onto the same responsible path. The reason why that is important that we do this individually, but also collectively, is because it is in the collectivity of individuals that the demand to governments and the demand to corporations is made visible. If we move over to low carbon or no carbon goods and services in our life, then collectively that sends a very powerful demand to corporations and certainly to governments that that is our expectation and that that is the only way that we will be able to move forward together. So it is a three-legged stool. It is definitely what governments do, but there we have a vote in all democratic countries. It is definitely what corporations do. And there we have a vote and a choice to make with what goods and services we purchase. And thirdly, it is about what we personally decide to do in our lives.
the first thing I'd say in terms of shifting our mindsets is there's no there's no um, there's nothing mysterious about this, right? This is about a clear decision and an intention that we will play a different role in the future. But there's certain things we can do that can make that stick. Because oftentimes we might try to make a decision that we will see things in a different way or play a different role, but it can be hard to change our habits, our mental patterns and our ways of thinking, whether we feel we're not empowered to participate in something or we're not genuinely part of a major transformation, we feel disempowered can be very um, pervasive. So we need to be quite deliberate about changing that. And I would point out two things in particular. The first thing is, it really makes a difference to take action. We really feel divorced from these major changes in the world. Making a plan and saying, I'm going to reduce my personal emissions. I'm going to engage with power in my life as a voter, as a citizen, um, as a consumer, as an employee, um, in all these different ways, raising your voice in those ways, um, really makes a difference. It makes you feel like you're participating in a great unfolding. And evidence has shown from around the world that those people who are engaged and active tend to feel more positive and more excited. They get into a positive feedback loop about the change we can make. And the other thing I would point out is I think that we have made a mistake in our mental attitude towards climate change about the relationship between control and outcomes. On climate, you often hear people say, that if you can't control the outcome, then why try? Why give up eating meat? Why don't fly on a plane? It doesn't make any difference anyway. You're just one person. But actually, in many other parts of our lives, we think about this very differently. Think, imagine if you were caring for a loved one who was sick. Actually, the control, the meaning comes from the fact, to a degree, that you can't control it. It makes no difference whether you can control the outcome, whether they get sick or in some cases even die. The fact that you can be there doing what is possible to help at a moment of crisis and show up is a fundamental part of who you are as a human being. And we need to shift to that type of attitude. None of us can control the outcome. However, we can all play our part in a meaningful and effective way. And that will then look after itself. And if we begin to do that, we take action, we change that attitude. It's not that difficult to change your mindset. And it really fills your life with meaning and purpose to do so. It's undeniable that we have advanced, we, the global community, has advanced remarkably in the past five years, especially since Paris, but also a little bit before the Paris Agreement. Um, and we will see the quantification of that at the end of this year at the 26th meeting of governments who will be meeting in Glasgow at the end of this year to report on what they have done. So it is definitely true that we have advanced on climate change over the past five years. It is also, however, definitely true that that progress has not been enough to get us onto the safe ground that we talked about in the beginning. We are currently not on track to be able to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by one half by 2030. And that is the difference between a world that is a disaster for future generations and a world that is a regenerative and a healthy planet for generations to come. So because of that, because we're still not on track, that is why Tom and I continue to work in different ways because we no longer work for the United Nations, but we continue to work to encourage and to motivate companies, governments, citizens, public authorities to make the decisions and take the actions that we all need to take in order to get us onto a safe ground. And I would, the only thing I would add to that is it's, it's as the future, the future we can create is becoming clearer. It's now entirely clear that it is possible for us to reforest and rewild this planet. It is possible for us to provide clean energy to everybody in a more equitable way. It is possible for us to produce food in a manner that doesn't destroy the environment, that allows the insect populations of previous years to boom. That world is becoming sharper and sharper into focus. 
And I, for one, am becoming increasingly mesmerized by the possibility that we can create that world in my lifetime and certainly in my children's lifetimes. And I want to live to see it. I want to live to see a world where we've brought back biodiversity, we've made the, the earth a forested planet again, and we have finally included and incorporated the most vulnerable people into the benefits of this society. So that motivates me every day to keep working on this, and I'm sure I'll keep working on it for the rest of my life. Bueno, amigos, muchas gracias. Gracias por compartir estos minutos con nosotros. Y nuevamente los invito a, eh, no solo a leer el libro, que es un libro relativamente corto y les prometo, simple de entender. Pero los invito no solo a leer el libro, sino a adoptar algunas de las prácticas y las medidas en su vida personal que sugerimos en ese libro para que ustedes también sean cada una y cada uno de ustedes parte de la solución de este problema que es global, pero que necesita soluciones personales.